All right, we're going. Uh, hi, so this is the community meeting for KCP for May 18th, 2021. Uh, this is being recorded and will be put up on the YouTube channel. Um, uh, a progress update from last week. There were a few big changes this week and some small changes following from it. One was supporting push mode. This is basically uh, instead of the cluster controller reaching into the cluster and installing a deployment to do syncing from inside the cluster, there's this new mode where you can run the cluster controller to set up a syncer, run a syncer outside of the cluster, reaching into the cluster. Um, I don't think we've still yet sorted out whether which model is uh, best in all cases. If there is a model that's going to be best in all cases, we might end up supporting both models indefinitely, uh, uh, or supporting a yet third model where the syncer runs externally completely outside of the cluster controller. Um, that is a topic yeah. that, uh, David, did you say that? Did yeah, you? yeah, sorry. Uh, I was saying that, about to say that this third uh, model is, is uh, already mainly available, especially yeah. for <clears throat> being able to debug stuff, for example, uh, you are able to, to run that. Uh, locally and, and debug that in VS Code. Yeah, yeah, it's certainly it's certainly a nice uh, development mode to be able to run the syncer yeah. completely separately. I think there's some questions about how, it, uh, if that's a model we expect to run in a like real world production scenario, how that process would be started and stopped and signaled. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I would probably say too, like this gets into like the longer term, you know, it's a, it's a topic that we're just doing just enough to get moving um, yeah. and to keep ourselves yeah. from being too baked into one mindset. So um, we'll probably put, we should assign that to one of the investigation tracks roughly, which is maybe, uh, maybe a combination of logical cluster, which talks a little bit about sharding and there's a transparent multi-cluster doesn't really care. Maybe there's a separate arc. That's a sub investigation of logical cluster, which is, mm. uh, or maybe, sorry, there's a, uh, and this is like, I was going to go put a diagram for this together, but like a logical cluster can be used by transparent multi-cluster doesn't require it. One of the dependencies for transparent multi-cluster is something like CRD syncing or CRD normalization. Another one is syncing. Syncing is a huge topic. Maybe we should just clone and spawn a, dis a thread for um, specific, the behaviors of syncers that we're trying to look at catalog of the field. We kind of talked about this. So yeah. Uh, you know, Jason or David, which of you would probably prefer to chase the sinker thread? Like we should just go ahead and talk about, you know, use cases that would inform it, what people are doing and then how it might evolve. And we can add some of these comments there, I guess. Yeah, I can uh, I can take that on and at least start a thread uh, or start an issue, maybe a discussion, probably an issue of like, these are the things we have been investigating. We need to figure out. I, I'm, I'm sort of generally curious how people expect to run this in, in a real world scenario. It's nice that we've proven we can move the code anywhere, right? Like the, the syncer just yeah. takes two configs and can, as long as you can get it two configs and the connectivity to the clusters, it, it, it'll do the rest. But uh, I am sort of curious how people expect to run this in a real world scenario. We don't have to answer that soon. Yeah, it, We can be flexible, but uh, I wanna know. Like and We did like, uh, Certainly, like the, the one of the, the third topic, you know, minimal API server is mm -hmm. a well usable library that helps you accomplish a particular problem domain well. I think on the sinker side, you were kind of dancing around what are the common patterns that you shouldn't have to solve? And like controller runtime and operator SDK and even cube controllers, like that's a, it's a fairly low level building block. Sinker is a higher level building block. Um, you're not really trying to solve the, it's more of like framework rather than library. You're not trying to solve one particular problem perfectly. You're trying to solve a large class of problems that are fairly generic. Um, garbage collector controller in cube is a namespace controller. And um, you know, the work that, um, that open cluster management was doing and like uh, almost every, Helm-like or config-like operator roughly has this problem. Um, they all have a bunch of special cases and broken broken glass and cut yourself if like you know, uh, 
the the canonical example I think of is with Helm, where they don't sync CRDs, they don't update CRDs. So like it's a great example of there's a class of problem that if we're trying to bring people together, reusable framework for syncing is there. And I know we've got the feedback from CapN that the virtual cluster syncer they think is the best thing in the universe. Um, Michael's got a, a bunch of depth there. I think like that that arc is about bringing the right people together in this community or in a related one. And then we can use the investigation doc to frame up where we're spending our time trying to build that collaboration. Yeah, I, I, I'm sort yeah. of curious also, with, so in, in uh, I think there is definitely a need for a for catalog, you know, uh, go out in the field and find all these other thinking type things and uh, compare and contrast them all together. Uh, I'm curious whether we will find that one of the sinkers that exist in the world is 90% of the way there and just needs a 10% boost to become the whole thing or whether we need to write <laughs> from scratch that is that is like general for the purposes that we need it to be general. I don't know right, right yet. I haven't, or, done, I haven't gone out the field yet to tell. But. We get the person who's 90% overlapped to go back and do their second version of it that fixes all the problems that they have and makes yeah. it general while abandoning their use. Like, cause basically the trade-off is going to be, you're going to give up one specific use case to get a broader use case. Yeah. Ideally to me, I I'm pretty convinced at least at a high level that transparent multi-cluster basically requires a general sinker with specific edge cases and you have to be able to catch enough of the edge cases, but you don't have to catch all of them. I think some of the other sinkers are, like the um, all the sinkers I've seen have basically baked in one or two of like the hard assumptions. If mm -hmm. we know what people's hard assumptions are, we can at least check them. Um, I think the big one that we're changing the narrative on is that CRDs uh, can't that have to be the same. Somebody is going like basically CRD normalization, CRD virtualization, and whatever we do there is a mechanism that fundamentally allows syncing to be more general, which not yes. everyone's had. Right. Yeah. Here, you had a yeah. Good... yeah, so like on that note, um, the there's a way that you can make the syncing so that we don't have to bake a specific CRD version, um, which is how uh, which is how Hive does it, right? They for them the objects are embedded in they're, they're just they're yaml indented mm -hmm. and another thing right and so it doesn't match the only thing that matters is what version of cr of that crd you have in the target cluster you don't have to do this thing where you import the crds into into like the kcp layer uh it right. can you don't even have to have them there at all let alone them, them being the right version so that'd be a thing to be concerned about if you've got logical clusters that are at different that assume different versions of crds or whatever um, I mean, theoretically, I suppose the CRD itself has a version in it. And as long as people are versioning those carefully, you know, V1 Alpha, well, V1 Alpha 2, that, then you can have actually, multiple of those in, you know, at the same time, right? And that's what we were kind of referring to is actually what, what I think for, tra for transparent multi-cluster to work, you need an object at the logical cluster level and you need an object under the underlying. But the trick is by looking at all the clusters in a specific scheduling domain, the, the, the candidate targets, you find whether those CRDs overlap and the lowest common denominator. So you actually make it an operational problem if they don't overlap. So that's kind of, that was what, that I'd say is like our contribution to this, moving this discussion forward, which is the idea that you can have a hard schema, which is the lowest common denominator that also, if that changes at any point, though if the world is no longer true, like um, somebody goes and removes one of those CRs on CRDs on the underlying cluster or changes the API version or whatever, then we would detect that as part of the core logical okay. cluster CRD reconciliation loop. And you'd say something like, hi, operator alert, uh, user A on cluster B made an incompatible API change hmm. that led I mean, to- Yeah, you, I understand that, but aren't you kind of like, I mean, how do you do an upgrade then across your fleet? You already yeah. have to have API compatibility to do an upgrade. That's, I think, the key thing we're going after is we're, we're eliminating all of those classes of problems where people are YOLOing it. And we're saying, no, no, the, the line we're going on is the logical cluster CR has to be able to survive upgrade. Mm 
And then we would reorient the universe. And I mean the universe, like OLM operators, whatever, around the mindset of if your APIs aren't stable, you don't belong on the underlying cluster. If your APIs have to change, you, if you need that flexibility, you go up to the higher level. So it's kind of a, this is the key point of the exploration. I agree with all the things you're saying, like you're right, Eric. And I think what we're trying to do is articulate how our trade-offs here would enable transparent multi-cluster as the core use case. But then we'd go find the people who actually may have already done 90% of this. Um, and, and like the point you bring up about Hive is if we believe that we can't do the CRD, the, the, if you can't define an API at the higher level, you're not presenting an API to the to the end user. So you're effectively going down to a, you're manu managing it manually. You define some API up to, above, which maybe it's a specific pinned version of pods or it's a special CRD that does magic. You still have to maintain API stability on that. I think what we'd try to do is say, Cube's core has to be forward compatible. Uh, that's something certainly like on the OpenShift side, we care very deeply about, right? Like we don't break API compatibility, but if someone does, and were to do that, how would you mitigate it? And I think the sinker would pick up use cases for things like um, maybe like an additional part of the sinker investigation kind of comes down to what do you actually do if the API versions get incompatible? Whose problem is that to solve? Is it the is it the person who provided that cluster for use problem? Is it the person who did the extensions problem? So like say something like um, Rook changes their APIs in a non-compatible way. If you change your APIs in a non-compatible way, you can't do, you, you lose a bunch of other guarantees. Maybe we're talking about like, what are the guarantees? Can we put this in like one of the investigation docs that we're gonna hold? And I think one of them is, if you can't provide API stability, you won't be one of these synced APIs, but you might be a higher level API that works up at the logical cluster level. Interesting. And so I only captured like a quarter of this. I'll, I'll add this to the, um, I'm, what, were we going to write this in the previous month's agenda, uh, Google doc, or are we going to do it as comments on the issues? Let's do, let's do comments on issues. Okay. I think the, the Google doc is annoying to have access to. So yeah, let's okay. kind of probably delete it, uh, and just uh, put things in issues. I'll, I'll record this chunk as a comment. So okay. I'll take ownership of this chunk of comments. OK, so meta, meta comment, Clayton, your keyboard's really close to your microphone. Yeah, I don't know. OK, so let me mute while yeah, you're just or whatever. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Eric, for mentioning that. Um, uh, yeah, so, so uh, to summarize for my own uh, understanding, rather than requiring Rather than sort of freezing CRD versions in time and saying you can't change your CRD version, KCP would KCP and the sinker would allow you to change your API only in compatible ways. And if you break compatibility, the sinker should at least signal the you know the sig the, the sinker and KCP and the cluster controller should at least signal to an operator, hey, this cluster uh, got an incompatible API change. Yeah, I so like the sync foos down anymore because yeah. we disagree about what a foo is. Like, so you have two clusters and they yeah. both are at deployment version one and they both have the same field. We shouldn't, if one of them upgrades, gets a new field, we shouldn't allow you to set that field on the deployment up above. It's not yet yeah. added. Yeah. When the second cluster adds it, then you should be able to transparently start using that field. Right. If one of the clusters was rolled back so that that field was lost, the best outcome, like this is like in my head, this sounds like this is the holy grail. KCP spins down your workload on the one that doesn't have it, does all the other stuff it can, and then either succeeds, and like deployments you probably should be able to, a lot of those operations are fairly straightforward, but allows you to move the workload to the cluster that's not impacted because you changed the API and you rolled back in an incompatible way. Mm -hmm. um, and then it should fire the alert, which says, we can't satisfy your spread conditions, but we prioritized availability over your spread conditions, but your availability is now reduced. And then some other, you know, e imagined ecosystem component that we're going to add, which says, like, we were talking about this before, is like the, are your applications meeting their SLA would be like, you would see your SLA number trick, you know, something somewhere, a number in a metric on a graph goes from, 
you're resilient to these classes of failures and it goes down one notch, which is you are less resilient. Mm -hmm. And then that alert triggers an admin to be like, oh, we didn't realize we were doing this. Uh, let's go find all the teams using that new field. KCP in theory makes that easy. Like, and again, this is mm -hmm. very API centric. Um, we should probably try to map these to like, uh, I, I, we have a lot of examples of this over the years in OpenShift for sure. Um, most people basically just like YOLO or uh, only roll forward, uh, but operators just blow that all up. Extensions blow all that up. Clouds changing what's on. Like if you have service mesh on in one cluster and not on the other cluster. So I do think anything we can think about in this use case, this is a true differentiator that nobody has today and can't build today without some of these tools. We may not build all the tools, but we should be able to articulate that like this builds on this, which then allows you to go do this. We're not there yet. Right. So the, right. The, least, oh, go ahead. The, the least common denominator thing, are we talking about having the um, having the KCP layer knows about a CRD foo, it's actually going to go out to the logical clusters and query what version they have and like do a Sember compare and get the lowest one of those to import? Maybe even structural compare. I mean, effectively, Cube is on a structural versioning. Not everybody follows that. We had a couple discussions the other day about like what happens when behavior changes when fields don't. But at a minimum, to add something to V1 Cube API, it has to be optional. And so by definition, we, in theory, and this is not perfect, in theory, the one of the investigation topics is going to be, can we show two clusters, one upgrades, gets the optional field, the structural comparison shows the common denominator and highlights that one of those is has a new field, maybe in an administrative operational focus way. We're not there yet. Yeah, that's, there a way, been a... that's, a way, that's a way like more brainy algorithm than what I was thinking of. Um, it, it might actually but... be that's too complicated, but... Yeah. Um, people with CRDs are already kind of YOLOing it on updates. And in most cases, when you add something that's not optional, you break right away. Trying to encourage the incentives for people to build extensions where they can test these sorts of things. Actually, like think of KCP as the minimal API server. A specific set of tests that we could add and help people with is API evolution, which is a super hard problem that nobody's doing, like everybody's doing this individually within their own domains. Thinking about Cube's power as like a control plane for APIs would be, could we make API evolution more predictable and have tools that kind of encode best practices knowledge? Like if you declare a V1, all new fields are optional. Oh, you didn't follow that rule? You're blocked. Um, other examples would be like behavior changes where we never catch those, but how would you set up a test framework? Well, you'd set up two clusters and then you move the app between them and you'd have a test that the behavior stays the same. Yeah. That would help us catch some of those failures that we've had in like our services. Um, and I, you know, some of the IKS guys also mentioned this as well as like, this is stuff that comes up over and over and over is like subtle API behavioral changes. Can't get them all, but the app focused ones, the more that we can hone in on making those testable in isolation, like even machine set API, you know, there's things that we can do that make the act of testing against multiple environments super easy uh, through automation. Yeah, that also made me think of uh, uh, when we have a transparent multi-cluster working with moving things across, you know, uh, uh, moving things across many clusters, satisfying all the constraints, it makes me also want a chaos monkey thing that just says, okay, everything's settled and happy here. Everybody unschedule, reschedule somewhere else. You know, you know, like uh, everybody you know, stand up and sit down. Do you still work? Do you do you I love this example too because the original like goal that Chaos Monkey at Netflix was building towards was whole region failures. Mm -hmm. How many people test whole region failures? And like if you go through the literature and you go through what they wrote over the years as they evolved this story, whole region failure is just really hard to test because you don't have enough control over all your dependencies. And one of the things I took from that is they were successively fleshing out the operational expertise they have at dealing with their dependencies, just like, you know, the, the pod smasher and cube, like the mm -hmm. hitting a pod and making sure your app comes up. Like you've built that into the normal fabric of operations that opens the door. So yeah, so I'd say a secondary goal of transparent multi-cluster and it should be captured, but if we don't, we should really flesh it out is it should be trivial to test regional disruption and dependency disruption in a meaningful way. Uh, 
And those are the, the, that's part of what we're contributing is helping get to that point. A lot of others have done very similar. Federation V1 did a little bit of this, but I think that's a, if we focus on it, we can really advance the state of the art in a meaningful way for operations teams. Like, is your service resilient? I don't know. Go pull the plug on one of the clusters. Does, um, uh, in your mind, does KCP make that easier to test? Because uh, in order to have transparent multi-cluster deployments or whatever have to specify their constraints and specify their dependencies. Right. Therefore, we have like visibility, KCP has visibility into what your dependencies are and can say, okay, anything depending on that topic, delete. Oh. And, and, and like, you know, again, this is like, we're, we're like, that's, there's a lot of like an arc spreading out before we could go explore. One really concrete example would be evacuating a cluster should be easy. It's not today. What's the most, like you need a verb somewhere or a, a field mm -hmm. somewhere that says this cluster accepts, accepts zero resources and the right thing happens. Uh, the presence of that knob for an operator maybe we tie it into an automated system, which is the health check, maybe we don't, but just getting to that knob would be a good like milestone goal of, you could simulate evacuation of a thousand applications and it, nobody notices. Like we kind of say like, you move the first app, your map moves, you didn't notice. This would be the, how do you do that in mass? We should design as like a second, third step goal. Yeah, and yeah, yeah, we, can we plumb in some uh, some like failure simulation framework so I can actually issue a command that says this logical cluster just died and it actually makes the other end of that respond in the same way that it would if it actually died right we sort of put a you know a, you know a shim in there I think that's a good idea too it's like um, when we design out like the APIs we're talking about are similar to but not exact that was kind of Michael's point in the threads like. The APIs we're looking for are domain specific. What's the transparent multi-cluster domain? There's there's capacity, there's um, there's permission, there's limits. Um, there's a whole bunch of factors. Can we tease them apart sufficiently so that these are easy to do? And can we make that, I, I have like the, the pitch line, I think Eric, it's implicit there is not only do we make, I think the goal for transparent, multi we're not even trying to make applications kind of just work at the next higher level. We're trying to give you um, the operational and the app development tools you need to do the right things on both sides and, and ping pong. So yeah, whether it's um, data center splits, like simulating a data center partition mm. would be like, cause again, assuming a network interconnectivity construct, um, sometimes that's gonna be managed outside the cluster. Sometimes it'll be managed in, but for instance, imagine that uh, network partition exists for other reasons like security or audit. Like what happens if you actually get a cluster compromise and you decide to put the cluster in lockdown mode or at least that portion of the workload? What would that look like to say um, stop all traffic at the boundaries, mm -hmm. um, uh, black hole all incoming connections? Um, and how can we overlap use cases? I, like it's funny because it's like I get excited about this because we're trying to put new tools in our toolbox, but we should try to make sure each tool has a name today, which is like, it's painful to do X or whatever. And I think like this loop here is, we could probably steer where transparent multi-cluster goes to either the HA side or the recovery or resilience side. I might lean towards the recovery and resilience side because practically speaking, multi-cluster HA might be a little bit harder. You do need a little bit of HA if you're trying to gracefully move but you definitely need to be able to test and simulate failure. Um, and maybe if, if, if that's not simulating, that's just part of normal operations, that, that's, that's not even a net win there. Yeah. yeah. Um, David, did, did you have something? I feel like you uh, kept starting to talk and then I, as I interrupted you. I just wanna make sure I didn't uh... Well, well, I just wanted to mention that that someone in in the issues um, already talked about you know when you register two um, uh, physical clusters into KCP currently, uh, then of course the CRDs imported the second time uh, just override the, the the CRDs that were created from the resources detected in the first one. So, of course, I answered that that it's it's really you know just the basic implementation that we did for now and didn't tackle any negotiation as, as Clayton just mentioned. But, but on the other hand, I think that 
um, on the Kubernetes fork side, you know, the hacks uh, that were done, we mainly have um, the CRD tenancy working uh, for, for KCP. So this should be possible to start maybe, you know, really small steps by small steps uh, working on this CRD <clears throat> negotiation or at least, you know, CRD um, compatibility stuff. Maybe as a first step, uh, I could look into something like when you add a second physical cluster, then we just check that the, the schema of the CRD is, if it's compatible or not, what are, what are the difference? And, and possibly calculate the least common common denominator uh, and and finally just uh, use this one at least that would allow us you know having a feeling of how it would behave because there is already the use case for that with you know i think deployments and 1.19 and 1.20 kubernetes and then and then we we would be maybe in a bit of better shape to um, take over the other part of this, which is how do we really uh, describe and define, you know, declaratively um, what really importing um, resources from a physical cluster or, or a logical cluster into a, uh, another logical cluster. What does this import really mean? I mean, at some point we will need to have some way to declare that we want to explicitly import some resources from one cluster to another one. So. But for now, we don't have these ways to, you know, describe that. But at least we could, at least implement um, schema compatibility checks in what we have today. So, if if, if anyone thinks it could be a good way to start, we, we could already start looking into that uh, with with what we have, and from this uh, have you know more insight into uh, how to to define this this you know more this wider um, resource sharing uh, scope, I mean, landscape, yeah. which is both virtualization, inheritance, and normalization and then that are described. Yeah, yeah. And then the, the uh, whether or not the CRD uh, type, uh, type details are compatible with each other feeds into a constraint that the cluster either satisfies. Yeah, exactly. Or Right. Yes. Well, as soon as we have, yeah. sorry, uh, as soon as we have, you know, this comparison and 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 the the process of this uh, settled, you know, implemented, of comparing uh, schemas and and calculating the least common denominator or or concluding that it's not compatible, then we could apply that um, in future future steps, such as you know, taking that as as a basis for for a constraint uh, uh, and scheduling constraints mainly. I mean. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, in order to demonstrate a a uh, a, a more transparent multi-cluster than we have today, the, the the demo we have now basically just says give this thing a thing and it splits it in half. It doesn't even reconcile it more than that. Like it doesn't even check on the status of that later. Uh, in order to get to something that actually demonstrates and shows stuff moving, we have to have something that tells it to move, tells it why it needs to move. Mm. Those are constraints. Those are things like, I never want to have more than two replicas in the same zone or something. And then uh, the, the CRD compatibility just becomes another constraint. And that then we get the Clayton's uh, demo of, I upgrade, things spill over into the new thing. I downgrade yeah, things. Exactly. Yeah, and, yeah. And, and I think like, uh, and to, to tie in another point, we were having the thread discussion about what is the cluster API, what does the placement API look like? I'd probably say, I think right now, my gut is what we should do is a first, while we're in, like, we need to be uh, doing two things, synthesizing like what people are doing, looking for opportunities to collaborate and being able to show those simple examples. So like, for instance, I'll just give like the, in my head, in transparent multi-cluster, you create a service, you create a deployment, they go to a cluster, an annotation is set on them that says which cluster, that annotation is protected by RBAC, whatever. There's another component that looks and makes a decision about setting that annotation, scheduling. And again, like not like doing this with the full cognizance that we might throw this away, but focused on the, what is the minimum viable thing while at the same time going and looking and stealing good ideas from others 
and looking for points of collaboration. Once you have that demo going, where we go from one to two to one to zero, and we're using like, and I'd say conditions are a great example of where we, that's like a net new thing is like use conditions for summarization. With that demo in place, then we can say, okay, the second iteration of this might go in a different direction based on what we've learned and based on what's in the community. But the behavior of the, ex the experience needs to be uh, at least as good as this. The thing I'm like, to be transparent, you have to minimize the number of external objects you create. I think that's another fundamental difference. It's not completely different. Federation tried this and karmata has got some variants, but like that's kind of what we're going for is yeah. the object with minimal changes, cube keeps working, everything keeps working. And then we can say, oh, well, maybe it shouldn't be an annotation. Maybe it should be another object. What transactionality do we need? What are the policies? Are those exposed, et cetera? Mm -hmm. All that's yeah. phase three, not phase two. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, definitely, I don't want to create a new uh, type unless we have to, or until we have to, at least. Uh, but I do think that describing various complex constraints will eventually require something more than annotations or something more than like yeah. a reasonable human human authored annotation. It could be something it, that yeah. Yeah. Uh, we we um so this is a thing that uh by the time we get to phase two, hope like by the time we have this demo working, there's a couple of other dimensions that Cube hasn't really explored. Like so we talked about briefly about aggregated API servers and virtual resources, but it's an incredibly powerful pattern that's hard to do unless you can fork the repos. And mm -hmm. aggregated API servers come with an overhead that's operationally high. Webhooks come up with a different operational cost. The problem we're actually trying to solve is, is to make those uh, for a, a particular customer or end user or platform domain be easy to tweak any three of those. So if it's possible to do virtual resources more easily, it's possible potentially that we have a sub resource on all objects, which is its policy object. You couldn't do that before, like Federation tried this and it was just too early. If you did it as a webhook, it sucks. I don't think the operational benefits of it outweigh it. Uh, there's that minimal API server arc all overlaps a little bit with some work going on in cube right now, which is could we have better extension points? So like Lua and Wasm have been proposed. Um, Jordan was actually saying he was looking at CEL, which is a common expression language. It's much simpler. And we were like, you know, could we, once we've got some of these base things in place, minimal API server, opening up some experimentation that would be, got a CRD. I want to drop in a new sub resource with this common expression that takes yeah. the input data yeah, yeah. and transforms it, which might be something that would help with annotations. Uh, could I do a WASM or a Lua plugin? Those are all possibilities. Could I just fork the repo and add a new hook? Not in the way that you have to do it today with Cube, which is like pulling teeth, but mm. like I have a nice, like what are the requirements for minimal API server? I've got some nice Go stanza where I'm like, I want to register these API endpoints. I want to use this storage yeah, backend. Yeah, yeah. Done. So that angle is, um, we won't really be able to improve those, but I don't, I don't want us to necessarily get stuck in the trap of everything has to be a CRD and a controller, especially when there are fundamental capabilities that would enhance the KCP control plane as a control plane use case, right? Like um, I want to add admission. Yeah, yeah this, this um, relates also to, to something that I, I fixed. Um, I mean, I started fixing in our, um, you know, about Kubernetes, about uh, table converters, you know, the, the, the the tables that you get, because for now, for all the legacy shim objects, uh, the table definition is, is mainly just, you know, code that you have for any object. And so, of course, for example, for the, the, the demo that we, we initially showed and that we, we now implemented, um, in order to have the, the deployment, the list of the deployments correctly shown, then you have to, you know, for now, I mainly detect uh, of course, we, we add deployments and pods as CRDs in KCP. But then when I detect that, that the objects theoretically were part of the, of the legacy shim, I just uh, plug back uh, the, the table converter from, from the corresponding object instead of, of the CRD one. But typically... <laughs> just yeah, test, I mean, David. <laughs> yeah, but, no. just to have, but just, just to show you, I mean, 
the, the, the type of limitations that we have with the current state of, of the CRDs. And, and obviously this would be, this just to me an example of being able to define part, I mean, most part of it from, from CRDs, you know, declaratively, but then having the ability to plug, just as Clayton said, um, using KCP or the minimal API server as, as a library, you know, as something that w in which you can plug also uh, behaviors, uh, you know, uh, that, that are, you know, implementations would allow typically tackle those type of cases. You have your object mainly defined in CRD, but then the ability to plug a number of, of you know, details uh, or like sub resources or, you know, you know, maybe table converters or stuff like that um directly inside uh, uh the kcp server so uh i completely agree clayton that <laughs> doing this is is quite seems quite a step backward i mean and that was mainly um a, a way to explore what should be what would be necessary to have uh the same you know table uh Power uh, in in typical in objects brought as CRDs that we what we have uh, in, currently in in the legacy shim object, um, and but that seems to me that that's the, the type of problems where we have to to make CRD based or de declaratively okay. based objects more you know yeah um, and, and I think we'll we'll definitely run into some run into some trade offs there. Um, Mm -hmm. as we go okay so we talked about phase two multi-cluster um phase one minimal api server jason was back this week um he and i chatted briefly he was finishing up some stuff he won't be able to talk till later in the week we'll try to collaborate and get a group of folks going he had a couple of people he talked to i want to go talk to some others and say like hey here's a group of people who will talk about minimal api server use cases um that'll just be that's kind of phase one what would minimal api server look like as a demo um, and then uh, we talked just now about syncing as a sub element. Um, were there any of the other core, um, I guess, logical clusters? I haven't made more progress on uh, what policy for logical cluster would look like, but it might be that's something that we come back to after minimal API server gets a little bit off the ground. So, so certainly, I think in terms of the syncing, I'd love to see whether we could get any synergy or alignment between the placement technology or API that we've got in open cluster management. And certainly with policy as well, you know, to think about either configuring existing policy objects or understanding whether policy objects have been applied correctly from a either an audit or an introspection point of view, right? I set of policies, I want them distributed across my logical clusters and I want those not that also is an area that open cluster management's looking at and if there's anything that we can do to either seed some ideas things that we found that worked or haven't worked there uh, or end up at a final state where one core api that's working here also is applicable in that uh, existing scenario for physical cluster management i think there's advantages to having those types of overlaps or those types of alignments Uh, yeah. Um, uh, so the second part was, does, does open cluster management also do something like the cluster API, like to provision a cluster to go out to some place and set up a cluster? Or does it sort of assume that clusters already exist? There's two layers of it. So um, open cluster management, as we use it today in ACM, is using Hive to provision, a, to provision an OpenShift cluster. Mm -hmm. However, the layer that then manages that cluster is intentionally decoupled from the provisioning lifecycle. So the idea that there is a pod running an agent behavior, it's a pull model, the pod mm -hmm. falls back to the cluster manager, and there is an operator for the cluster manager that's an operator hub IO, there's an operator for the cluster lit agent that's an operator hub IO, the community uh, operator is there today, but those establish a understanding of the cluster. There's an API called manage cluster, there is an API called Clusterlet, which is the agent. There is a way for those to establish the identity of the cluster. And then there's a way to distribute work down to the cluster. Those pieces are intentionally decoupled from the provisioning lifecycle. Hmm. Yeah, that, that makes sense. That's, uh, 
that is a reasonable separation of concerns, I think. Uh, and I would want, I would want KCP not to, not to conflate the two either. I think, I, uh, uh, I think Michael, before you joined, we talked a bit about doing a survey of uh, other Sinker, Sinker-esque technologies and sort of figuring out uh, how close they are to what we would need, how close we are to what they need, whether we should, uh, well, we should all team up. In what ways should we team up to uh, avoid overlap and uh, increase synergy? I hate that word, but increase synergy. Well, I, and, and Michael, I think like the point, there was another point too, I think is, um, I don't think, I think where the phase that we're at is it would be better to have real flawed, non obviously thought, non completely thought through and perfected APIs to study from, then it would be to delay those for perfection. And I think this kind of gets to like the cluster placement versus like a higher level placement. So what I would probably say is like the themes and the mechanisms and the use cases, the more that those are shared, the more that those are documented between this group and the other folks that we'll end up having to go talk to, the better. And then if we, we know like, like as an example, like in the placement, some of the placement stuff that you had was drawing con concepts from Cube um, mm -hmm. and similarities. I think that's a key point, which would be um, co-opting what already works for familiarity reasons um, is likely something. And so like in my own head, thinking about some of the transparent multi-cluster stuff, I do think that there should be uh, tolerations and, uh, node selectors that are uh, sucked off by the sinker or by the placement story at the higher level that you can't tell the difference between a label that a cluster would have or a label that a pod would have, but that's managed for you, which I think is like the dual of what you're doing, which is very concrete, you know, cluster assignment. The merging of those at a higher level, having a really concrete, like this works great for clusters, this works great for pods. And then we can say, okay, how would we actually give control to the operational side, but the applications team just gets a, a value that they that they supply, or maybe it's defaulted. I think um, I think that angle is useful as well. So I'm not as concerned if we, I would say that the first couple of iterations in KCP are about exploration and throwing stuff away. And then the community discussions would be, can we point out why their use cases, uh, can we quickly orient ourselves to like use case A, oh, or API A, it was designed for this use case. Oh, it misses these use cases. Oh, we didn't have those use cases. Great, let's pick a big chart or a big table that shows the trade-offs. And then the second loop around with you in that example use case for clusters, we might say, oh, we've had a great idea that we could steal and bring back down to the cluster level or bring back down to the cube level. Um, Certainly taints and tolerations are not the be all and end all of scheduling avoidance. And we've gone through like eight iterations of spread mm -hmm. and anti-affinity. Uh, I suspect we'll go through like five more. So there's an element of, um, I'm a little bit of fan of throwing stuff at the wall uh, to see where it sticks for specific use cases. And that's fair. I think um, at a minimum, what I'd suggest is as we are collecting the use cases, I can supply the ones that we've been thinking about in open cluster management, because I think there's overlap in the use cases, certainly, yeah. and evaluate what is the most appropriate way to solve those with a concrete API. I did want to ask, so that's um, so that was the one thread, which is Sinker and Sinker policy. Um, are there other threads that folks thought about since last week? Um, I know there was one email discussion or there's an issue discussion about the uh, global load balancing. Probably that falls under transparent multi-cluster. Are there, uh, there's been the discussion about uh, could Hive use this? And that was the sharding. How do you go do high scale services? That's kind of uh, trickling along. Um, Devin's, Devin and Eric and others have been iterating. Derek um, did a follow up with him. So that thread is more the, KCP as a generic control plane for a high-scale service that is still much of an exploration. Um, were there any other ones that I've missed that we want to call out that deserve to be placed in the hierarchy of thought? Um, I, I saw the, the global load balancer, uh, Joaquin, you, you posted this. Um, 
I don't know if we ended up with a if with anything more concrete than yes, it should work, but we don't have any specific like any more specific guidance about how it should work. Yeah, we'd love it to work, but uh, you know what's next on there. I don't have any other any other sort of overarching topics, but we could go into that if, if you want. Um, I would suggest as one friend that Mara's attention is how do you manage the health of the application or workload that you are slicing across a logical cluster getting distributed out to multiple physical clusters? That's something that I think we've been looking at from an open cluster management perspective to gather metrics and send metrics back. But more generically, is there a concept of a health check definition or health check API that is similar to the health check live probe that are on pods, but that can be expressed in a way that validates the application, maybe with other synthetic tests or um, basically probing for application availability outside of the clusters in which the application is running. But I'd, I think that would be a useful, it, it's, it, it's similar to or, or aligned with that idea of the global load balancer in, in some sense, because it's, it's something that's not necessarily, may or may not be provided by the clusters themselves, but maybe a service that is aware of those clusters and consuming workloads running within them. That's a, that's a really interesting one too. I think it touches on Eric's point earlier as well as um, if we're going to do failure simulation, then failure simulation, or if, if the normal mechanics of what we're building lend themselves really well to failure simulation of very real world types of failures, then um, the dual of that is that if we simulate it and we don't also detect it, we've missed an opportunity. Um, and there's lots of ways to attack it, but we kind of want to, we want to maybe like it, there's an application level aspect and there's an operational level aspect. And then maybe there's a um, one nice thing that health checks do for pods is that they're a very simple concept. And they, while they have limitations, the simple concept works well enough most of the time. Um, maybe like we should think through what is the simple signal of health? Is it readiness? Is it something more um, more appropriate? Is it a, a synthesis of signals? Is it something like an SLA or an SLO or the SLI that drives both of those? Um, I think uh, one question I would have is um, it probably should look like something we're already doing in a couple of different ways. Um, who would be the right people to have that expertise that they can bring that forward? I think, Michael, you've got some of it. And, um, you know, SRE folks who are looking at summarizing status across existing multiple clusters today through observability would have some of it. Um, I'm wondering if we actually need to put ourselves in a spot where we could uh, force ourselves to have to go attack at least part of the problem um, to uh, do it. So maybe like with the transparent multi-cluster, to simulate the rebalance, we're going to have to simulate one type of failure. What failure would that be? Uh, yeah, and and I think uh, not just uh, delete, you know, delete a cluster or or something and see everything rebalance, but watch somehow watch aggregated metrics while it rebalances and see what the effect was on that. Uh, uh, if people are using transparent multi cluster to put workloads closest to their end users, uh, and one of those clusters goes away, it's presumably going to get slower for one of their users. And we should be able to see that in some aggregated metric, um, not just as a like demonstration of how this went wrong, but actually how it went right, like how the, you know, everything worked, it got a little slower for people, but at least it's still there. Um, uh, Aggregating metrics has not been something I had thought of so far, or or sort of collecting and putting them all in one place, and and uh, global load balancer health checks also is something we'll have to. Yeah, observability. Um, observability. Maybe the argument would be uh, like pod logs, like accessing a pod's individual namespace. Maybe there's an opportunity here to say what's the one remove interface that works really well. Um, and that's, you know, kind of 
saying like whatever your aggregation solution is, um, the aggregation solution has to give you enough input that you can make meaningful decisions. What are the meaningful decisions for someone running an implicitly HA service that should be, you know, we should bake in SLI and, you know, concepts that um, both measure, monitor, and maintain that loop is really important. So maybe it's like, a, maybe that's like, a, we, we tee that up as the, what is the observability dual to transparent multi-cluster? What's like transparent observability look like where you don't actually know the mechanism or the implementation, even though there might be like a couple of obvious ones. Um, what, how do you, cause cube kind of punted on this and then we came back around and just used, most people just use Prometheus or one variation of that ecosystem um, early on. Uh, the project had some ideas that were kind of, you know, we, we just didn't plan out. There wasn't really a technology in the space. Prometheus kind of sucked all the the oxygen out of the room on that. Um, could we set up a similar scenario where either, you know, a de facto standard emerges or the use case demands someone actually go solve the problem and people are like, this is such an important problem that we want to solve it by doing this integration uh, because it gives such a big win to an operations team. So like the, the API that you create that creates the need for someone to integrate with it. Same thing for load, load balancer too. I think that's a, it's the same kind of argument, right? We'd, we want to have the right primitive for, for global load balancing and the implementation might vary, but there's probably still an implementation that is obvious to someone looking at it. I'm going to say from an SRE standpoint, having aggregated metrics would be like huge boom. Yeah, uh, I, I completely agree uh, with the caveat that it, it seems like uh, another huge scope increase uh, for for what we're doing. Like, like I completely agree. We need it. We like in order to in order to have transparent multi cluster, you have to be able to see what's happening in there. But at um, least let us at least give us the 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 hooks to write it. Yeah, you know what yeah. I mean. Yeah, and yeah. that's it. I, when I tried to poke at the concept of health check, like. I don't have a, an answer for that one. It's not something we dug into deeply enough in other forums. However, I have kind of an idea around there should be an API that I can define that's simply giving me a up or down, right? Just that simple up or down doesn't have to be aggregated metrics, whatever that check is, that it's something that can answer, does the service appear available, yes or no? And mm -hmm. that would be a starting point to enable more of Eric's use cases without necessarily dramatically overwhelming the scope. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Uh, uh, at first blush, it should be easy, relatively easy once transparent multi-cluster exists, gigantic asterisk, to uh, annotate a service to say, health check this somehow. Annotate in the general sense, tell, tell a service health check this, and then have a controller that watches for annotated thusly services and runs a, a you know a probe against it and reports, you know, updates the status of it with failed last health check or whatever. Um, but uh, uh, gigantic asterisk aside, and also I'm sure there's way more complexity to even that than, than the thing I described, but it seems like something we could get at least a little bit of progress on once and, the rest of the universe exists. And, and I would say probably like we should, um, I would say the investigations in KCP are intended to show working things that catalyze ideas that then either fold into existing projects, spawn additions to existing projects, um, or if necessary, we, we're not quite certain yet, um, lead to KCP. I would say probably transparent multi-cluster as a use case. You know, I was kind of, uh, Jason and I were kind of spitballing, and I was thinking about this after, would be um, I could see KCP dev eventually being a number of repos in a number of different domains that correspond to the investigations where for some of the investigations, it might be like minimal API server. We might have some examples for transparent multi-cluster. There might actually be a, a legitimate project for logical clusters that might be documentation and design explorations, but it might belong to SIG multi-cluster or cube API server. Um, for observability, there might be a working group that is incentivized to go solve this. Um, maybe that doesn't actually have to happen close to this group, but we should 
think I, I think like we're trying to be as much of a conduit as we can to say like somebody should think about this. Can we catalyze the discussion to happen where we're natural to integrate with? And by we, I mean the general control planes for cube. And when someone goes and does that, it really changes the narrative for a particular problem domain. So not being a throttle or a gate, just being super focused on getting to the point where we could be a test bed. Um, yeah, uh, we are now out of time. So sure. thank you everyone for uh, showing up. Please, if something stuck out to you in this conversation, please add it to the agenda notes. Uh, I will post this recording and update the notes on the issue. Uh, otherwise, I'll see you all on the internet. All right, have a good one, everybody. Bye.